Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Fiscal cliffs, fiscal catastrophe for New York and other states. From the final report of the State Budget Task Force, lots of bad news. Good news, not so much, if any. Bringing us the news, again, mostly bad, I don't know how much good, is Richard Ravitch, the co-chair of the State Budget Crisis Task Force, along with former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker. Mr. Ravitch has a distinguished history of public service. He rescued the Urban Development Corporation in the 1970s, is widely credited with saving the MTA as chairman from 1979 to 1983. He also chaired the 1988-89 Charter Revision Commission. He ran for the Democratic nomination for mayor in 1989. He has served as Major League Baseball negotiator. And in July 2009, he was sworn in as Lieutenant Governor of New York. He's New York State government's Mr. Fix-It, a civic treasure. Always a pleasure. Welcome back. Nice to be here. Okay. So you woke up this morning, and what are you most concerned about among the, all the buzz out there? What does Richard Ravitch focus on? At the moment, I'm more concerned about the fact that the media covers the politics of our fiscal problems, but doesn't look beneath and say, what are society's needs? Do we have enough revenues to pay for them? And if not, what revenues should we exact in order to be able to meet society's needs? That is the beginning of the question. Um, it's not the end of the question. You can't be judgmental about <clears throat> uh, what a politician does just on the basis of contrasting it with what other politicians right. do. You have to look. For example, take the issue that's front page news these days about pre-K education. Right. And uh, the millionaire's tax. Uh, and the millionaire's tax. First of all, uh, People can disagree about the importance of it. I happen to believe that if you want to disinvest in the future of the United States, the best way to do it is to cut pre-K education spending. Mm. And we've been doing that. Rutgers came out with a study that said last year, states spent $650 million less on pre-K education than they did the year mm -hmm. before. Pretty serious. Right. I'm delighted that both the governor and the mayor believe that we should spend money on pre-K education. I think the question is, what's the best way of administering it? What is the cost? And the secondary question is, what tax base ought to pay for it? The federal tax base, the state tax base, or the local tax base? That's the way to analyze this. And we're, we're on a Has university. anybody done this? Well, I haven't seen it. Uh, I haven't seen it at all uh, analyzed that way. It's mostly reported as a, as a Cuomo de Blasio issue. Yeah, I, I think oftentimes when I talk to reporters, there's an emphasis on the political rather than the policy. I think that's sort of a, a general inclination of reporters, editors, and the masthead because it, it, it attracts eyeballs. It sells papers. And it's intellectually less demanding than trying to get on. Oh, man, so a solution. Come on. You're Mr. Fixit. Well, fix I, I, look, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the administration of pre-K education. I'm trying to read about it, learn about it. I can't find anything about it in the current papers, although the Times has an interesting story uh, this week about uh, what the program that Jersey has, which apparently was reasonably successful. I know. I'm, I I'm from learn. Jersey and on a school board, and the answer is yes. Uh, I want to learn about it more. Uh, but I really want to understand what it takes to run an effective program, how you deal with the high percentage of children who are growing up in poverty and are deprived of parents who have any motivational uh, uh, you know, energy to, mm -hmm. or skill to, to get their kids educated, 
and I want to understand what the geographical dispersity is within the city. Now, if you don't understand it, who understands all this? Well, I mean, I'm no expert on education, right. but but you are this, an expert on on fiscal matters you know, and what the revenue. So I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is as to which tax base we right. pay for it, except I have a a personal view that uh, the larger the tax base, the more equitably a cost for, that benefits all of society gets shared. So, And that is? The federal tax base. But, but is that, that, that ain't going to happen. Well, we live in an era in which every group of taxpayers, whether they're federal taxpayers, state or city taxpayers, all say taxes are too high and we want to reduce taxes. And everybody makes all kinds of arguments, some of which I'm sure have validity. Uh, the taxes are uh, uh, disincentives for people to make money. Um, the taxes uh, are burdens that cause people to move to other jurisdictions. Um, You're I, not totally not convinced sure. about not, any of that. I, I'm not, sir. I'm not. New York, the greatest period of prosperity in New York State's history, our New York State income tax was much higher than it is today. Um, look, I have no doubt that cutting taxes is politically popular and that it has some economic benefit. But what I want is a dialogue right. among serious people about what the social needs are of this society. When I read that in New York City we have a million seven hundred thousand people on food stamps yep. and that twenty percent of the kids in the public school system are growing up in poverty, yep. uh, when I see the number of homeless people increasing as it has over the last year. When I see all the reserve funds that have been built up by the city in period of prosperity having been spent in the last couple of years, when I see the pension costs and the health care costs rising, obligations, contractual obligations that the city has, its statutory obligations, when I see um, uh, uh, no labor union, no public employee, the, the beneficiary of any collective bargaining agreement at all, <clears throat> I say to myself, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty out there. Right. And, and I can't really personally have a judgment about the state budget until I understand more about what's going to happen to the city of New York fiscally, and I'm waiting for the mayor's um, initial cut at his budget, which comes out in early February, right. before I could have a meaningful judgment. But I do know this, Doug. And that is that every city upstate is under enormous fiscal pressure. It's incredible. It's cutting back expenditures as best they can in order to deal with the fact they don't have enough revenue. They have opted out. They've gotten all one-year advance payments from the state already, right. so yep. they're not going to be getting any more help from there. There's no additional aid to municipalities as I understand it, in the governor's budget. Uh, and yet these cities, be they Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, or wherever, every one of them, they have obligations they have no control over. They have to make the pension well, contributions. And then Nassau and Suffolk, we've got a whole string of counties. Uh, that's correct. It could correct. be dominoes. I mean, then you could have a fiscal apocalypse with these dominoes falling. And what they've been doing is they've been borrowing to cover their operating deficits. And that's what our report said is the most irresponsible possible thing. You do not borrow money to cover operating expenses. But that's what we do in New York. We, we have promissory that our jurisdictions are allowed to pay with promissory notes on pensions. Pension. Well, how did this ridiculous. happen? Come on. Because the political system was not willing to exact a tax in an amount sufficient to make the contributions to the pension system that the law required. It started in 2010, yes, sir. And this is, what else is, okay, what else is irritating you lately? Go ahead, go to well, it. No, it's not irritating me, it's troubling me. But troubling. What else is troubling me is that uh, I look, uh, f to the best I can understand it, the MTA is about $15 billion short of what it needs in its next capital plan, and not to invest enough to maintain a state of good repair in the MTA means we're starting down the slippery slope again. We, and I had the benefit of, uh, or the burden, if you will, depending how you look at it, uh, of inheriting a subway system that was on the verge of 
of total collapse in 1979 because of disinvestment. And I see that starting again. Wow. So, I mean, a little Cassandra, no? No, I, oh, I, I'm accused of that all the time, but I think some people have to Sometimes Cassandra's express right. <laughs> occasionally. That's correct. Oh, As a matter of fact, Ed, Ed Koch once wrote an article in which he said just that. No, I'm sorry. He, he wrote me a letter in which he said, I know you're being accused of being Cassandra, but you should tell everybody that Cassandra was often correct. That's right. I mean, just like paranoia is often justified. Okay, let, let's, let's go for some good news a little bit. Let's step sure. back a little bit. And that is Richard Ravitch is coming out with a book at, in April. So much to do. What is the, give, give us a preview because you're coming back to talk about the book. And give us a brief preview. Well, it's a bit about my experiences as a New Yorker in business, but primarily my involvement with, in, the, in my public service in New York. But the reason I wrote the book really is I, I am so concerned about what is ultimately expressed in this report mm -hmm. Uh, of our state budget crisis task force Go ahead. that um, cities and states are in many respects on unsustainable courses and that um, what happened in 2008 was very had a terrible impact on states and mm -hmm. cities um, but that is not what started a process of balancing budgets with borrowed money or with the proceeds of asset sales right and by definition, that's an unsustainable practice. And it's got to stop or ultimately they'll run out of money. And it's not unique to New York. Arizona sold its state capital, used the proceeds to balance its budget, and then leased the capital back. New York State, 20 years ago, sold Attica Prison oh, and used the proceeds to balance its budget and leased it back. Chicago, <coughs> uh, hocked 75 years of parking revenues, used the proceeds of that borrowing to balance their budget in, uh, four years ago, and they have no more parking revenue for 75 years. Uh, all, all to avoid the tough choice of raising revenue, essentially. Correct. Or cutting an expenditure. Right. And, and it's perfectly valid, but that's what the debate ought to be. It ought not to be ducked and avoided by imprudent and less than transparent budgetary practices. And that is the serious uh, message in our report. In a sense, Detroit has become both not only a material place, but a metaphor. I mean, you mentioned places that have gone on to, you know, Puerto Rico, San Bernardino. I mean, there, there, there are lots of places like that. What what is the, the larger issue here of the relationship, for example, of cities to states to the national government? I hate to sound like a professor, no, it's but a, it's federalism. Well, this is a university uh, station. Thank you. So Thank you. I can I'm sound like a professor. I'm glad you do it. It's Thank nice you. to be able to talk about this subject with somebody who knows something. Oh, well. Um, but it's a good question. First of all, I want to remind everybody that under our Constitution, it is the states, not the federal government, that have the responsibility for public safety, yep. education, health, the public infrastructure. Two, that cities are corporate creatures of states. Right, Dylan's rule. I, my, my students love it. Go Third, ahead. that there's about $650 billion in the federal budget that are passed throughs to states. And about, uh, um, and about half of that is Medicaid, and of the balance, about half are pass-throughs from states to cities. Right. Now, you look at the public debate about the federal budget and the compromise that was reached this year, sequestration mm -hmm. is over. That was devastating to cities. Crazy. But it, we're still going to have cuts, and I assure you the most vulnerable part of the federal discretionary budget to cuts are those programs that are administered by municipalities. Sure. Because they have the least powerful constituency in the Congress of the United States. So another major point we made in this report is there is a frightening disconnect between the federal budget process and what happens at the state and local it's, level. It's astounding. And also, not only do you have these systemic problems, but, for example, you're really getting no leadership from the White House. 
on these issues, on infrastructure development, really. So I think, you know, you've got not only systemic institutional factors, but you've got personal political factors here as well. You know, I, it'll surprise a lot of people, but my book is, uh, uh, is I pay a lot of homage to politics. I don't think politics is a dirty word. No, word. it's ennobling. Politics Come on. is what makes democracy work. And you, you cannot govern in a democracy by being above politics. Uh, the former mayor of the city of New York tried, or that was just a charade? Uh, Mike Bloomberg? No, no, he was a, as much a politician ah. as any of his predecessors. Ah, ah. And in fact, the, looking at New York City, you mentioned early on... And therefore, of, he was pretty good mayor. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that the new mayor, Bill de Blasio, really faces a, a, a serious budgetary fiscal situation here with the, the, the lack of municipal contracts. Wow. Look, at, look, look at the plate of New York City from sort of the mayor's chair, if you can. Look, he's a very decent, honorable human being. Uh, his heart's in the right place. His concerns are the right concerns about this city. He's got a big learning curve to go up. He's got some very talented people around mm -hmm. him. First deputy mayor, his budget director. Yeah, I, good people. I've known for, for forever, and they're very, very able people. And it's too early to make sure. any kind of judgment. Sure. I'll wait until we see he's got to come out with a preliminary budget right. in early February. Right. And then he's got to come out with an executive in budget April. Yep. in April after presumably the state has enacted its budget. Uh, well, I mean, if trend goes, uh, continues, I mean, we're going to have a budget on April Fool's Day. I mean, yes, I, uh, we will. And that's, that's a good thing to have it on time. I think it's absolutely absurd for the state's fiscal year to end March 31st. I so recommended when I was lieutenant governor that it be moved to June 30th, but nobody paid me attention. I mean, yeah, this mismatch bu budget cycles between the city and the state really creates a real problem where they go well, from April 1 to March 30th, while in the city we go from July 1 to June. I mean, there's all kinds of ridiculous well, it, problems there. It created a benefit for many years because of what they call the magic window. The right. To go borrow, ahead. To borrow in the interim. But that was all bonded out some years ago, and therefore... There is no justification, uh, fiscal, political, or otherwise, to, to do it otherwise, other than it would be cumbersome and costly to make the change. Medicaid. Both the national report and the New York State report point to Medicaid as a real problem, and a political problem in the sense that it's a third rail, but certainly a fiscal and financial problem. Talk about... Medicaid and what might be done with it in terms of increased service and perhaps reduced cost? Well, I think the um, state is doing a pretty good job in trying to contain the rate of growth of Medicaid expenses. Uh, I think number two, I wrote and spoke out frequently to the effect that I think that since 40% of Medicaid expenses are expended on people who are, are already on Medicare, right. that the Fed ought to pick up that portion of the, right. not 50%, but 100% of that portion of it. So, But that ain't happening. People, no, it's not happening. Go ahead, now, but okay. But that, that's okay. Funny. Third of all, <clears throat> given the uncertainty of the future of Obama health care, it's hard to predict. I happen to believe mm -hmm. that every American should have health insurance, uh, and I happen to believe that it, it would have been better if we'd gone to a single-payer pa plan, right. and I don't quite understand why the president has never didn't start off that way. I understand. But he abdicated total responsibility. Put, to the insurance company. Right, right, and the, the, and the Congress, company. right. Well, because... No, in fairness to him, Go ahead. because the insurance companies had too much clout, and there's no way they could have passed a single-payer system uh, under the circumstances. But that, that is the right. desirable goal. We're the only large industrialized society that doesn't provide health care for, for our citizens. So there's a lot to be unresolved. Also, the formula for distributing federal Medicaid money 
is adver works adversely to New York's interest in that uh, <clears throat> we have rich people, we have a lot more poor people, but our average, therefore, isn't as low as it is in Mississippi where there are very few rich, right. rich people. So Mississippi gets a much higher reimbursement rate than New York. Pat Moynihan tried to change this for years. Oh, God. And Decades. He, and he right. finally gave up and concluded that the reason it's unfair is James Madison's fault. You know, those damn founders, they really screwed up. They built a government that was meant to be did grid gridlocked. And, <laughs> and it happened. Go ahead. Two senators for every state. That's I know. And you can't change that. You can't. Nor should you, really. Oh, man, I'd like to strip like, <laughs> this whole section. Oh, no, I'm, don't, don't start me. Local fiscal stress. We alluded to it earlier. Local governments are badly strained. What, what, what are the major immediate issues, and is there, is there a resolution? Retirement obligations. Yeah. Are rising faster than local revenues. So what do we do? We either have to raise revenues, or some people think uh, uh, reduce benefits. But we can't because of the Constitution. So I guess well, that the easiest solution would. I don't be to think raise we revenues. can for much more fundamental. Oh, reason. go ahead. Because I think <clears throat> a promise to pay interest to somebody who lends you money. Which right. we all view as an inviolate sure. obligation. Right. But it is morally indistinguishable from a promise to pay a benefit to somebody who worked for you for 20 years. Okay. So those people who say we're going to solve the fiscal crisis by cutting back on pension benefits, in my view, are outrageous. Everybody's going to have to put a piece of their you-know-what on the table to solve this problem. Okay. But what pieces do people have to give up? What pieces do workers have to give up? What pieces do? Uh, I mean, do, I mean, we do, live do in we a want democracy? To, do this we, has to be bargained. Okay, 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 uh, okay. I'm not Solomon, and I'm not prepared. I have my own values. We, they may not be the values of the majority of people, but this has got to be resolved politically. It cannot be resolved by pretending the problem doesn't exist, or by expressing rectitude. Uh, ah, public employees, ah, rectitude about ah, the tax system, that gets you nowhere. Oh, but that's what anti-rectitude, that's, a, am that's, anti, a, camp, I, that's a campaign slogan. I am, Come on, I love I am it. against the newspapers just ooze with rectitude. Oh, so man, I, I love it. I, I think we should have a campaign, an anti-rectitude campaign. I could, I mean, I'll sign up. Oh, come on. Okay, debt. What do we do about the massive debt, state debt? You see... And all the this backdoor is, debt and authorities. Come on. What do we do? Doug. Okay. Uh, we, we wouldn't have a transportation system or a highway right, system if we didn't have debt. Right. It's not the amount of debt that's it's the what? problem. It's the lack of revenue to service the yes. debt that we need. Yes. So, what do we do for transit? You know the MTA. You issued several reports, one major task well, force. Well, study. I have to say that uh, uh, the legislature did enact one of my two proposals in 2009, and that was the payroll tax, even though it got watered down because the Senate Republicans right. wanted to use it as a political issue in Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, they, the Senate rejected... Um, rejected my second proposal, which was to toll the East River Bridges. And actually, it's rather interesting that the three Democrats, Democrats control the Senate in 2010, the three Democratic senators who Go ahead. Uh, killed the tolling proposal are now, I think, in jail. Or under <laughs> indictment or about Or under indictment. indictment okay. They're no longer in the Senate. Is the... Is the tolling of the East River Bridges something that really could come back onto the agenda and have a Must rational have. discussion on yes, this? Absolutely. You think? Does the mayor do? Who, who starts this discussion? Oh, no, no, no. There are all kinds of plans, former traffic Right, mission. but I mean, you need some Sam political push. Uh, uh, Bob Yarrow, regional plan. Yeah, no, I know. It's good stuff, but 
Sure. Where's I mean, the political I proposed muzzle? It when, right. When I was 25 years ago, and, and um, as chairman of the MTA, I proposed it and got absolutely pilloried by every editorial in the city. Yeah, Except for the Times. You could, you could write another, uh, another book called For Whom the Bridge you know, Was <laughs> right, Told. Right. So that ain't happening. So how do, you, how do you reduce then? What are the other sort of policy options out there to deal with that? Well, look. Go ahead. Uh, I know I'm being naive. Go ahead. You're not being naive. You're being purposefully and wisely provocative. Uh, the, the answer is... There are a lot of things that for which we can exact a revenue. Uh, we could increase the registration fees on automobiles uh, very su substantially. Yeah. We could increase the gas tax. Yep. Uh, I respectfully think that... You're not winning on this uh, platform, but go ahead. Well, I, I happen to think that 99% uh, of the people, if polled, would have no idea how, when they buy gasoline have any idea how much of what they pay is, goes in the way of taxes. And I want to tell you a story. 1979, Jimmy Carter proposed a three cent increase in the gas tax for the Highway Trust Fund. It never got out of committee. It never went anywhere. A year later, President Ronald Reagan proposed a four cent increase in the gas tax, one penny of which was to go to mass transit. And it went through the Congress like a knife through butter. And I was then chairman of the MTA, and I'm invited to the bill signing. And a reporter said to the president, President Reagan, how could you support a four cent increase in the gas tax uh, when you got elected on a platform of no new taxes? And the president looked at this reporter and he said, it's not a tax, it's a user charge. Hey, come on, we're gonna have to end. So I believe in a nickel user charge per gallon of gasoline to finance public transportation, bridges, and roads in the state of New York. Wow, we got to end there. This is your proposal. My thanks to Richard Ravitch for being on the show. We look forward to seeing him again in the spring when we look at his sort of mixed memoir and policy book. Next week, it's baseball. We'll talk with George King III, Yankee beat sports writer for the New York Post, here on CUNY TV. Excellent. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.